Hello, my name is Filomena Bluise and I'm professor of indoor environment at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment of the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Before I start this talk on how airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 confirmed the need for new ways of proper ventilation, I want to first thank Sue Rove for inviting me to write a chapter in the Routledge Handbook of Resilient Thermal Comfort with the same title as this lecture. I also want to acknowledge a group of 36 colleagues from all over the world, especially Professor Lydia Morawska. Already in March 2020, just after COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization, this group worked together to convince the world that airborne transmission is important to consider. Without this group, WHO would not have been convinced that airborne transmission is a serious route of transmission and therefore is important to account for in the fight against COVID-19. For the studies that I will present hereafter, I would like to specially thank Christoph Hermans and Gerrit Veenstra of the German Dutch Wind Tunnel Institute, Professor Fulvio Scorano of the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering and Marco Ortiz and Dadi Sang of my own group. At the 5th of January 2020, WHO published the first disease outbreak news of COVID-19 on the new virus. Three months later, at April 4, one million cases were reported. At the end of the summer 2021, worldwide, 228 million cases and almost 5 million deaths were reported. At the end of this March 20, 2022, the counter says more than 480 million cases and more than 6 million deaths, and we're still counting. So what do we know about this virus? We know that respiratory infections are caused by the pathogens exhaled through the nose or mouth of an infected person. The pathogen, the coronavirus in this case, is aerosolized from sites in the respiratory tract during breathing, speaking, singing, shouting, sneezing and coughing, forming so-called respiratory droplets. The coronavirus is therefore not naked, but encapsulated in water-based particles containing water, salt, protein and other components that are part of respiratory secretions and saliva. While these particles or respiratory droplets have a wide size range, most of them lie within the range from sub-micrometers to a few microns, the coronavirus itself has a size of around 120 nanometer or 0.12 micron in diameter. When exhaled, droplets can spread into the environment, depending on their size and weight. The blue particles shown in this figure are larger droplets that typically have a diameter larger than 100 microns, which fall to the floor under gravity within 2 meters of the source. The red particles are small droplets, also named aerosols, typically smaller than 100 microns, which can stay suspended for a longer time. How long and how far a droplet can stay or travel in the air depends on the droplet's size and on the local airflow conditions, like air velocity, temperature and humidity. In still air, particles of different sizes have different settling times. Based on the so-called Stokes law, calculations show that in still indoor air, Exhaled particles of a diameter between 5 and 10 micron take 8 to 30 minutes to fall to the floor from a height of 1.5 meter under the influence of gravity, while particles with a diameter of around 50 micron will take about 20 seconds to settle from a height of 1.5 meter. So, in still air, droplets smaller than 10 micron can remain suspended in air for many minutes. But the air indoors is not still. 
the distance a droplet theoretically can travel is shown here for low indoor air velocities, 5 cm per second. As you can see, a particle of a size of 5 micron can in theory travel up to 100 m with low air velocities, while a particle of 10 micron reaches circa 25 meters. With high indoor air velocities, 20 cm per second, these distances can be a factor 4 further. Another aspect that can affect the travel of a droplet is the relative humidity of the indoor environment in which the droplet is traveling. As soon as a droplet is expired, the water part will start evaporating. How much will evaporate depends on the relative humidity and the temperature of the indoor environment, as well as the chemical composition of the droplet. In this figure, an example is shown of a droplet with a size of 10 micron containing physiological levels of salt and protein before evaporation and its size after evaporation for different relative humidities. For a relative humidity between 20 and 80 percent, the droplet will shrunk to around 4 micron, approximately 40 percent of its original size. Then we come to the question, how is SARS-CoV-2 transmitted? In theory, SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted through direct or close contact with an infected person. Through indirect contact, via deposited or transmitted infectious droplets on surfaces such as a ball here, these are also named fomites, or through so-called airborne transmission, in which virus-carrying droplets produced by coughing, sneezing, talking and even breathing are transmitted via the air, including both large droplets and aerosols that can linger in the air. So, when in close vicinity of an infectious person, this whole range has the potential to be transmitted, while when further away, the virus can be transmitted only by aerosols suspended in the air. This means that in theory, aerosols can be transmitted both by inhalation at short and at long range. Now how can we reduce transmission? To reduce direct transmission from mainly large infectious droplets, physical distancing has been adopted. And for indirect transmission, although we know now that this transmission route doesn't play an important role for this virus, cleaning services and washing hands. For people who need to or tend to come close to possible infected persons, personal protective equipment is used, such as facial masks and protective gloves. From the information presented before, it is clear that physical distancing is a good measure to reduce the risk of transmission by large and small droplets. But it's also clear that it is false to assume that all exhaled droplets fall within the distance of 1 to 2 meter, and that therefore physical distancing in itself is enough in public spaces to prevent airborne transmission. It clearly is not. Therefore, the use of proper ventilation measures has been recommended to decrease the risk of far-range airborne transmission. This means, first of all, to provide sufficient and effective ventilation. Ventilation that ensures the supply of clean air and exhaust polluted infected air from the breathing zones of each individual person, preferable without passing through the breathing zones of other persons and without recirculation of air. If general ventilation seems not enough, or recirculation, reuse of air, cannot be avoided at air cleaning devices. Ventilation can be established by just opening a window, natural ventilation, or can be established by using a mechanical ventilation system, varying from only exhaust to very advanced air conditioning systems that supply and exhaust the air. Mechanical ventilation gives the possible 
possibility to control the amount of air that is supplied, exhausted and or reused, while natural ventilation is an uncontrolled form and therefore a less reliable way. Natural ventilation depends on several environmental aspects, such as the wind and temperature outdoors, but also on the dimensions of the space and the possibilities of having openings in the facade. Now, next to the type of ventilation, also different ventilation principles can be selected, such as mixing ventilation, displacement, displacement ventilation, cross ventilation, and personal ventilation. With mixing ventilation, the air pollutants are diluted, and therefore it reduces the number of infectious aerosols in the air. Displacement and cross ventilation move the air horizontally or vertically through a space ideally replacing polluted air with fresh air. Then face masks. The use of face masks by the public since the outbreak of COVID-19, obligatory or not, has led to diverse and numerous designs. But which mask should we choose? The surgical look-alike mask, probably the most used mask and by far the cheapest to buy, originally developed to protect the patient from the exhaled breath of a surgeon, a KN95 or FFP2 mask developed to protect the carrier from pollutants such as fine dust, rather expensive and difficult to buy as a consumer, or a washable mask made out of cotton or another fabric with or without disposable filters that you slide in. Or even a mask you make yourself of old bed sheets. In the summer of 2020, we have visualized in our labs the leakage of the exhaled air for the first three masks. In the following movie, you can see this visualization, starting with the first mask surgical look-alike mask. A mist of water droplets colored with a fluorescent paint is produced and made visible by the shining light on the droplets. The second mask we tested was the FFP2 mask. You can see less leakage around the mask as compared to the first mask. The colored mist tends to escape more upwards and less on the sides, but is still visible. With this mask you have to worry less about the escaping aerosols when standing behind someone wearing this mask as compared to the previous one. And finally the third mask. The cotton mask with a removal filter inside. Almost no leakage occurs. In any case, no visible leakage with the camera we used at that time. After this video went viral, at the request of many, we have studied the leakage that occurs with exhaling more in detail. Tests were performed with 14 different masks. With the use of a breathing machine and the use of ultrasonic vibrations, water mist colored with a fluorescent tracking fluid was generated and exhaled by a mannequin head, as you can see here. The leakage was recorded with a camera. These pictures show images taken from the side of the four masks I presented earlier, 
added with an image of the exhaled mist of colored droplets without a mask. The images clearly show that a mask prevents the exhaled aerosols from going forward, depending on the filtration capacity of the material and the number of layers used. For some masks, the droplets go right through the mask. It can also be seen that outward leakage can occur on the sides, going backwards, with the nose going upwards, or chin going down. The aerosols that leak are not exhaled to the front, but are sort of redistributed into the space. So also for those aerosols, ventilation is required. Then we arrive at air cleaning. Since the start of the pandemic, different filter or cleaning systems in a mobile form or permanent in the central unit are used as additional measure indoors. Filtering of particles, for example, with HEPA filters or cleaning with UVC light, the ultraviolet part of the UV, spe UV spectrum that can inactivate bacteria and viruses. Now, most UVC systems make use of UVC with a wavelength of 254 nanometer, which is harmful to skin and eyes and can therefore not be used in the vicinity of people. UVC with a wavelength of 222 nanometer, on the other hand, is not harmful to people and has shown to be effective in inactivating, for example, SARS and MERS but is, as far as I know, not available yet in a system on the market. Additionally, it should be noted that UV lights can only deactivate the pathogens that they see, and that in dusty docks or rooms, passing pathogens may be shielded from the UV rays. To investigate whether a mobile HEPA filter system can be used as an additional measure in, for example, a classroom, we have tested the cleaning effect with the use of air-filled soap bubbles instead of the color mist droplets that we used with the masks, as well as the effect on sound and air velocity, the draft risk. We tested that for a mobile HEPA filtering system for different settings and positions in the experience room of the sense lab, that's a lab that we have available for these kind of tests. It will probably be no surprise that the mobile HEPA system came out as a good additional measure next to natural ventilation. But it must be said that the system can result in unacceptable noise levels and draft effects, and the HEPA filter's cleaning performance depends on the setting of the system and also the position in a room. So it seems that more than one system is needed in one classroom, which causes again an increase in noise and draft effects. Still work to do there. Then we arrive at the key question. How much ventilation is required? How much should we ventilate? Well, this is not an easy question to answer. Current guidelines for air quality indoors are based on the CO2 concentration in air that is allowed. CO2 is used as an indicator for the presence of people. With every breath we take, we exhale CO2. Now, with the equation shown here, it is possible to calculate the required ventilation rate per person in a space to keep below the allowed CO2 concentration. The air distribution effectiveness in that equation tells us something about how effective the air is distributed. For example, with mixing, with complete mixing, this value is 1. When we use natural ventilation, opening windows, single-sided or two-sided, this effectiveness can vary depending on, on the temperature differences, wind direction, and dimensions of the space. Now, assuming a limit value of 1200 ppm, an outdoor concentration of 400 ppm, 
and the seeded adult producing 8 liter CO2 per hour, 18 liter CO2 per hour, this would result in a required ventilation rate of 6.25 liter per second per person for a ventilated room with an effectiveness of 1 and twice as much for a room with an effectiveness of a half. Now, whether these values are enough to prevent transmission is not known yet. Of course, we can ask ourselves whether CO2 is a good indicator of exhaled infectious aerosols. CO2 is a gas, and exhaled aerosols and droplets are no gases, and most likely don't all behave as gases. Or could it as a proxy be true for aerosols? If CO2 is a good proxy for exhaled infectious aerosols in, for example, classrooms, where do I place the CO2 sensor? And is one sensor enough? Now, recent studies in the field, as well as in the sense lab, which I showed before, have shown that CO2 concentrations can differ significantly in a classroom, depending on the ventilation regime. A classroom with natural ventilation would require at least two measurement points, one on the wall, opposite, opposite to the facade with the window, and the other on the wall nearby the teacher. Additionally, it was found that the outdoor CO2 concentration can also vary per location, but also during the day, which implies at least one CO2 sensor outdoors as well. Now, in the case CO2 is not a good proxy for exhaled aerosols, which is very likely, are there other models we can apply to estimate how much ventilation we, sh we need? Now, to cope with the risk of airborne transmission, the most used model has been the Wells-Riley model presented here. Based on this equation, it is theoretically possible to calculate the infection risk for a certain ventilation rate and the number of persons present, assuming one infected person. Unfortunately, this model or equation has a number of limitations such as that it does not account for the differences between persons. Not every person responds the same upon exposure to the virus, and not every infected person releases the same amount of quanta, infectious material. Furthermore, it is assumed that the concentration of infectious aerosols is homogeneous in the indoor space, or in terms of ventilation, there is a complete mixing situation. It is assumed that over time this uniform concentration is constant and therefore the ongoing inhalation of the concentration is constant as well. Nevertheless, the Wells-Riley equation could be useful in gaining insights into generalized infection risks for a range of certain situations and in terms of ventilation these may possibly best relate to measures to reduce that airborne risk at a larger population scale. However, to those seeking workable solutions at building level that reduce cross-infection through improved building design and ventilation measures, this use is limited. In any case, it is clear that ventilation of a space will decrease the concentration of possible infectious aerosols. How those infectious aerosols will distribute and possibly meet a healthy person on the way that can inhale them is difficult to predict with ventilation at room level. To really reduce the risk on transmission to nearly zero, you will have to exhaust the possible infectious aerosols as close as possible to the source. Personal ventilation seems a possibility, under the condition that the directions of the flows are considered as well. Most available personal ventilation systems are focused on supply of fresh air into the breathing zone, not on the exhaust. But of course, many other possibilities are thinkable. See here, for example, 
this headset with a built-in air cleaning comprises of an electrostatic filter for particles as small as 0.1 micron and also an active carbon filter for removing smells. Unfortunately, this product is not yet on the market, but I hope it will come available soon so we can actually test whether this works. Now, what is important not to forget is that infectious aerosols are not the only possible pollutants present in a space. It has taken several decades, decades to convince the authorities to account for other sources of pollution than people in a space. Think of emissions of construction and furnishing materials, the outdoor air, pollutants originating from bad maintenance of ventilation systems, and not to forget all those volatile organic compounds and particles that are released during the many activities we, the occupants, perform at home, the office, school, uh, and so on. Moreover, it is important to account for the other indoor environmental factors that interact with measures we take with respect to ventilation. Opening a window can introduce noise from outdoors, but also introduces the cold air during winter time. Last winter, many children at our schools were suffering from this, sitting in classrooms, classrooms with windows and doors open in order to get enough fresh air, but also in situations with a mechanical ventilation system. Problems with noise from the increased airflow in the ducts, the so-called rustle of the air, have increased because systems were put on their max possible airflow for as much ventilation as possible. Not to speak about the drafts this can cause. So, in conclusion, assuming airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is a route of transmission that seriously needs to be considered. It is clear that the question is not only which ventilation rates are required to protect against infectious transmission, but also how one should ventilate for a certain situation. It is important now to rethink ventilation, specifically for indoor spaces with a high density of people during a long period of shared time, such as educational settings, offices, hotels, restaurants, hospitals, care homes, theaters and gyms. The new generation of ventilation system should not fo just focus on the ventilation of a space, but provide a range of ventilation options that fulfill the demands of the occupants over time, whether related to health or comfort. Flexibility is therefore the key. While well, research is clearly needed, but cooperation with different disciplines, such as epidemiologists, virologists, aerosol experts, building engineers, architects, behavioral psychologists, and ventilation experts, experts is indispensable. Moreover, the combat of future diseases should be taken up hand in hand with the climate change challenges we are facing. Well, thank you for listening.